to Spotlights. This is the podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. And as usual, I am your host, Sam Mickey. And this week, I'm really happy to welcome back onto the program, Kimberly Carfor. Kim, thanks for making time for us. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm very happy to have you. And uh, for frequent uh, listeners or watchers, they might know that you are, uh, I think, our most frequented uh, guest on the program, partly because uh, we live together. But uh, more to the point is that you are the uh, co-chair of the Religion and Ecology Unit for the American Academy of Religion, the AAR. And, uh, and you've been doing this for a little while now, and so we've had you on uh, generally sometime after the annual meeting in November and uh, to kind of talk about what's been going on, to give people kind of an update, where's the field at now? Because, of course, American Academy of Religion, kind of the biggest religious studies uh, conference, so it's a massive gathering, lots of scholars, and uh, and people from all areas of religious studies, including people doing ecological work in religious studies. And uh, so we've done it a couple of years, and so now it's kind of a tradition. So we're doing it again. And this will be our New Year's episode, because uh, we always release episodes on a Monday. And this year uh, it happens uh, January 1st, 2024, will happen to be on a Monday. So um, I thought it would be a good time to not only reflect on what happened at this year's AAR, but also what's going to happen uh, in the future. And of course, 2023 was really kind of a big year for uh, religion and ecology. It was the 25th anniversary of the Forum on Religion and Ecology. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the 10 year anniversary of the program that you got your PhD in, uh, the Ecology, Spirituality and Religion program at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And we had the uh, founding chair of that program, Elizabeth Allison, on um, recently, and she was talking about uh, ESR. And then, you know, more uh, academic programs, more courses out there. Uh, there's more. Uh, publications, of course, there's more uh, positions for faculty. So religion ecology just really uh, blooming this past year. Uh, so I'm curious if you can give us um, some highlights. What was some of the stuff that uh, some of the big takeaways uh, from the AAR this year? Yeah, so it'll be hard to nail it down, but it's a great introduction uh, to, to think about how, you know, where the field came and how much it's grown. And you know, I actually have a lot of fun when I introduce people to this field. Uh, so actually, you know, kind of random story before I get into the kind of nitty gritty of the, the field and what happened at the AAR and in the uh, religion and ecology unit in particular. So I actually was on the plane ride home after the conference and I ended up sitting next to someone who was a scholar, uh, a Sikh studies, uh, no, Baha'i, he was a Baha'i uh, scholar. And, you know, we can always tell who is a religious studies scholar. I don't know. He knew I was. So he just started talking. We ended up talking the whole flight home. Um, and he was just really intrigued about the field. And I just love introducing the field to people who don't know about it, because I think um, people are, are starting to see how ecology fits into their field of study. And so I could see that he was thinking through this and, and you know, even had a follow up like, great to talk to you. Do you have any uh, resources on religion and ecology or a, an intro book. So I was like, sent him to the Forum on Religion and Ecology website. And I sent him the Mary Evelyn and John uh, reader. So it was it was just fun. I feel like that was kind of this uh, metonym for the field in and of itself. Uh, and it feels to be like it's a privilege to introduce people into the field. So in terms of what's happening in the field, uh, and in particular, what kind of panels did we have? So the first uh, panel, it wasn't really a panel, it was a co-sponsored uh, session or more like a reception. Uh, so the ISS RNC uh, co-sponsored something with, for, with the Forum on Religion and Ecology. Uh, so the ISS RNC is the International Society for the Study of Religion, Nature, and Culture. So kind of like a sister uh, unit, a sister organization to the forum. Uh, so they had a little reception and had two speakers. One of them was uh, Dr. Christopher Carter, who has been on the podcast before. Uh, Christopher is also uh, on the steering committee of the Religion and Ecology Unit. Uh, and he's talking about his, uh, and you had him on the podcast before. Uh, yeah, actually a couple times. He was one of the oh. very first guests um, way back in 2020. Could that be right? And, uh, and then came on a little bit more recently to talk about uh, his uh, book, The Spirit of Soul Food. Right. Yeah. So he was, you know, get talking more about the spirit of soul food. It's wonderful to see a colleague just hone and develop uh, and deepen his message. And so uh, gave a, a, a very good talk on um, basically the spirit of soul food. 
Uh, and so then the next day we had a panel on pedagogy uh, in, in the field of religion ecology. Uh, and this was actually Christopher's idea in a meeting we had with the uh, co-chairs and the steering committee. Uh, he he was the former co-chair and he said something about, oh, we haven't had a, a session on uh, pedagogy in a while. And so uh, it's it's really important to have these conversations and for professors in the field of religion and ecology to stra share strategies. I mean, number one, and I'd love to hear your take on this, uh, people who teach uh, climate change, I think very much uh, there are tools on how to introduce the topic and then how to uh, work with students who might need extra office hours or spiritual tools uh, when they really get into kind of the, the existential depths of, of what this means or, or feeling into that. Uh, so talking about pedagogy and, and uh, climate change, uh, but also uh, Christopher talked about kind of his strategies. He teaches this food food and history course. And so he was really encouraging, you know, bring your whole self into your pedagogy. Uh, and there are feminist implications, right, uh, in that, that uh, not for all people, all places, all times, right? There are certain things you're not going to want to share. Uh, but but I think that when you share parts of yourself and and why do you do this work? Why do you care about the field of religion ecology? What is food to you? What is your history? How does it connect to your ancestry? Uh, for me in particular, when I teach, you know, nature immersion, what is my history? What's my story? How did I get, um, I wouldn't say converted, but maybe a little converted into this field, you know, why did I fall into this role? Uh, so what is it about you and your personal story, I think, helps to get students interested and, and connect to their own personal stories and how they can connect to the field uh, or, or the work in that way. So also in the, the panel on pedagogy, thinking about community engaged learning, uh, and I've heard this term a lot more in recent years, how do scholars of religion and ecology become uh, more public facing? You know, it's one thing to teach students how to do this work, you know, what is environmental uh, theology, what is, you know, religious environmental ethics uh, as a theoretical tool, but then how do you integrate it into your community in a sustainable way, right? And I always tell my students, you know, part of what climate change is or, you know, the work of eco-theology is we all have certain networks, we all have certain influences, spheres of influence, and so I empower them to plug into their own spheres of influence, right? Yeah, that's so crucial. I know, uh, you know, Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm often refer to religion ecology, not just as an academic field, but also as a force, the field and the force. Right. And that's really where the force comes into play is uh, it's not just uh, ivory tower discourse. It can't just be about publications. It's got to be right. somehow engaged with the broader public with the real world, as it's sometimes called, right? and uh, whether that means activism or advocacy or service, but there's got to be something where you where you plug in like that. So yeah, that's a really great point. Yeah. And this year's panels were very much, and this is very much kind of my, a little bit my, my kicking the, the field in this direction. I'm a very practical person. Um, and it got brought up in that panel, right? The big, so what? So what, why should I learn about this? Uh, and I love that term, right? I, I, I love the word force, right? Because a force can be, you know, you can be a force for change, a force for good, uh, a force of positivity, uh, a force of networking, right? But a force in terms of activism, right? Because when I think of activism, I think of, you know, people on the front lines, like holding, uh, you know, picket signs or whatever, but sometimes it can be a little bit more subtle, right? And so I think empowering people to think about different creative ways, right? And I think that term force really gets at that, right? How does studying this field light you up? And I think that question right there aligns with the the lineage holders, right? The, the founding of this, the visionaries that kind of founded this program, right? Uh, if we're to think of the, the Thomas Berry lineage, right? That uh, or the Brian Swim that finds something in this field that lights you up, right? And that by being lit up by this gives you the energy to do the activism and to do the work. And right, I think making that connection, that spiritual connection, that connection of activism is, is really important. So uh, let's see, I'm kind of going chronologically in terms of, because that's how my memory works. It's nice what gives uh, you know, anybody who's listening or watching uh, a kind of sense of what it was like in real time. Uh, and you know, here's what it was like <laughs> on Thursday or Friday and Saturday. Yeah, and, exactly. Because uh, it is like a, what, a five-day conference altogether? Yeah, yeah there's, if, there's, so there's quite a, quite a bit. If you go to the whole thing, it's five days, yeah. yeah. It can be exhausting, but, but pretty exciting. 
so yeah, I think at this point we're on Friday. <laughs> Uh, so we had a co-sponsored panel with the Native Traditions uh, in the Americas unit. And so that panel talked about climate justice, traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, and that one was really well attended. It was about 75 or 80 people. And, you know, that's not the only goal of the field, but I think that that does demonstrate that there is interest in it, right? Oh, yeah. You want you want some people in the room for sure. It's, yeah, yeah, it's not just a popularity contest, but yeah, <laughs> it's it's definitely part of it. Uh, yeah. So kind of giving a shout out because you mentioned uh, Elizabeth Allison, Dr. Elizabeth Allison, who was on the previous program. She was uh, presenting her work on, you know, traditional ecological knowledge um, and how climate change has affected uh, kind of ritualistic practices in, in the Andes. So so talking about her kind of uh ethnographic work. Uh, and then the next day we had a panel on thinking more about eco-spirituality and uh, the title was Vegetal Philosophy. So we were trying to think about um, uh, Simone Bay and different people uh, that are not really necessarily traditional thinkers in the field of religion and ecology, but trying to integrate them and their insights uh, and bringing new ideas uh, in, into the field. Uh, and then the next day we had another co-sponsored, it was a triple co-sponsorship uh, between the religion and human rights panel. Uh, so that's one unit or unit, the religion and human rights unit, uh, the women in color, women of color scholarship, teaching and activism unit. So that's a second unit. Uh, so that one was on resilience and decolonization. Uh, and so I, I I think that that's very much where I see the field going in two or three very strong directions. And I think that this idea of, you know, decolonization is not a metaphor, right? That art, article by uh, Tucker and Wang. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think it's really easy for scholars when we get feedback that there's this new movement or this new concept, this new idea that we integrate it into our theory, but this idea of how to do the work of decolonization, it's not a metaphor. It's not just something that you can kind of add to your theory and stir and then nothing happens, right? Uh, the work of decolonization in and of itself is an activist movement. It's transformative. There's material exchanges, right? Uh, and so, so really trying to think about what that is in, in terms of uh, the, the communities that that work is connected to. Uh, so that was an excellent panel. And then uh, the next one, we, had, you know, we're actually a pretty big unit in terms of the field or the the conference, uh, American right. Academy. Yeah, yeah, because there's some small ones out there, yeah. and it's easy to think, oh, we're all just kind of tiny units. And then when you really look at the number of panels you have and how well they're yeah. attended, it's um, over the years actually become sizable, which is saying a lot because it also has related units. Like there's the animals and religion folks or religion and food right. and those intersect. Exactly. And even with those other units, religion ecology really still stands out. Still stands alone. Yeah. So ones that are similar, like you said, religion and food, there's a religion and animals, uh, but still it's, it, and, and this is kind of why I bring up 75 to 80 people that show up based upon they call it um, the health of the the unit, right? Health and 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 how many people are attracted to it, how many people apply to your the unit to try to get uh, to present at the AAR. So based upon all those numbers, uh, they offer you specific number of panels. So the bigger you are, the more uh, papers uh, proposals that you attract, the more sessions that they give you. And so there are some units that get maybe like one or two sessions. Uh, plus the co-sponsor, we had uh, seven of them overall, six, six, and then that um, ISIS RNC uh, forum. Yeah, the reception, thing. and then six. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. So it's all just very exciting. Um, very exciting because of just thinking, like I said, thinking about where it started and, and then where it's going. Uh, there's a lot of momentum building, and it's really cool because uh, the panel that I uh, presided over. We had our business meeting after that, and you know people get to come up and and tell you their ideas and 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 tell you you know oh well next year I think you should do this, and this year in particular there was a buzz and it was it was palpable and it was really exciting. There was this buzz of people coming up and being like oh 
you know, I really like what you're doing. I really, this is so exciting. Oh, I'm doing work in this field. Oh, I'm a new doctoral student. And I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think about, you know, uh, the concept of Buddhist sentience and how that relates to what I'm doing? And, and it's just really exciting because I, I could see it light up at least, you know, people that came up to me, at least three people that were kind of lit up by the conversations that were had in the panel and then kind of moving into the business meeting. Uh, so that's a really good feeling where it kind of inspires me to keep doing the work when you have those moments. That's true, right? Yeah, the opposite would be very uh, deflating. You're like, anyway, nobody talks about it. Nobody's interested. And sometimes you get this feeling that there's definitely people who are just presenting at conferences because yes. it's just part of their job. Yes. And then you get some sense people are like, no, this is really something where by studying this kind of stuff, we can affect positive change in the world and you know, positive change within academia. And right. it's not just uh, another line on your yeah. CV or something like that. And yeah, that excitement is really, to me, something that I've, I've seen in the field of religion ecology since I first uh, learned about it mm, yeah. um, almost 20 years ago, uh, is that there's a lot of people who have a deep passion for it. Yeah. And, uh, and that's really exciting. Yeah. And of course, other you know areas of religious studies and other areas of academia have that too. Uh, but it seems uniquely uh, kind of a bright kind of uh, a side of, of religion and ecology. After all, I mean, the fate of life on earth is at stake. So it makes sense that people are like really pretty motivated. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think when you feed it to them in like a, I don't know, they get a, a taste of it through the papers and the words that someone's using, the metaphors, the, the, the groups that they're studying, the ethnographic work they're doing, um, the philosophies that they're using, uh, when when it when it makes sense to someone, you, and that's I think when I the, the digest digestible piece, and you see them light up, it's it's pretty cool, yeah, because it it gives me hope, right? Because I think that light is what is gonna you know create the change that we need to see to make this work continue to happen. Yeah, and that's something I've been asking people a lot on the podcast lately: is like, what's something that gives you hope? And so that's mm -hmm. a good one where you're like, actually the field, and when you see the way that it excites people, whether it's, you know, people who've been related to this work for a long time or people who are newly discovering it, when you see that kind of passion, you're like, okay, well, yeah, we have some energy here. So if we can really harness that kind of energy, then we have a, a future. Yeah. And uh, and otherwise, you know, it's, it's easy to despair because, of course, you know, there's more academic programs in religion and ecology than ever before. And there's more carbon in the atmosphere than ever before. Right. So, you know, things are getting better, but they're also getting worse. And so you just kind of wonder how can we get the better side going more? And when you see how many people are really passionate about uh, about pushing us toward a sustainable and just future, that's uh, that's hope. Yep. Yep. And so on that note, um, in terms of the business meeting, we have been getting over the years that I've seen it since being in this role, I've seen each year more and more people reach out, more units at the AAR uh, that want to co-sponsor a panel together. So once again, I find that also to be very exciting because it feels like what I would call like the ecological creep, right? Like once uh, the environmental discourse gets further in the news or maybe if you're living on a coastal city and you're just watching the water you know right uh, creep creep in the sense of uh like a creeping a plant not in the sense of a very <laughs> a strange creepy, person who's maybe suspicious <laughs> maybe a criminal uh so yeah important to distinguish i'm guessing most of the people would have uh listening to this or watching would have picked up on that but just just to clarify it's very uh, important yeah the ecological creep uh, but yeah, right. Everybody's connecting to it. I mean, as the environmental crises of the world get worse, everybody's realizing they have something to contribute to make it better. So it makes yeah. sense that every unit is starting to be ecologized in a way. So yeah, yeah, that's cool that more people are reaching out to you being like, hey, ecology, right? Like, yeah, that's yeah. what we do. Yeah, I felt like a very popular girl on a prom, right? Like you, we had to turn people down. Sorry. <laughs> Like my dance my, card's full. My dance card's full. Yeah, we only get three co-sponsorships. Um, yeah, we had about seven or eight people ask us, which was a lot. I think it was uh, three or four the year before and then two the year before that. Um, but once again, it's a great way to promote the website, um, the, the forum, because depending on, you know, they send an email, they say, oh, we're interested in doing, you know, Christian concepts of environmental justice. And I'm like, 
um, that sounds great. You know, maybe you can, and I would try to empower them, like, just because you don't have to co-sponsor with us, you can just have an ecological panel for you next year. And so I send them to the website and here's some research if you want to kind of bulk up your uh, environmental knowledge or make it connected to your field of study or unit. Yeah, that's great. And the environmental justice uh, hub on the forum website is pretty uh, robust without trying to make this a commercial for the forum website. Although technically it is the forum on religion ecology podcast. They are sponsoring us. Yeah. And, uh, but that's something that's really come together a lot in the last couple of years of of really robust um, thing that wasn't there before. There was environmental justice stuff scattered, but didn't have kind of the hub that it does now where it's just easily accessible. like, likewise with eco anxiety. That's something right. people talk about a lot. And I've had a few people who are like, if only we had some resources for eco-anxiety, yeah. especially how it relates to spirituality. And I'm like, here's this thing. And they're like, oh, that's a lot. Thank you. That solves the problem. <laughs> and they're like, nice. we're looking exactly. for some kind of hub. I'm like, there it is. Yeah, the work's already been done. Yeah. Well, it takes a lot of work off my plate because I don't have to just send a book list and, you know, yeah. click on links. I just send them to the website and then, you know, tons of resources. So Yeah. And that's great that the Religion Ecology Unit is helping all units become ecological. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's definitely the Laudato Si, the call from Pope Francis and the Catholic Church, right? Is that that everything needs to become ecological. And so make your connections. How do you you make your field of study or right design or politics or economics, right? Yeah, even things like there's like the religion and sports unit. I and love like, that unit. Yeah, right. And things like, well, yeah, outdoor sports are being heavily impacted by climate change. And so even religion and sports, believe it or not, ecology mm-hmm. relates to it. So yeah, it's it's there for everybody. And adventure sports and how that's a yeah. spiritual endeavor. Or yeah, not enough snow for the Winter Olympics. They have to make artificial snow for the skiers and stuff like that. And right. Uh, yeah. Or certainly the summer Olympics where it's too hot for people to run and so they have to oh, change the times of events. I was noticing that. Um, actually it wasn't the Olympics, but it was the, the most recent like track right, championships. World, world championships. Yeah. They had people that were, there was a lot more heat exhaustion during yeah. the marathons and things. Set up the cooling tents and things like that. Yeah. Where just, go get yeah. The I need more structure. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's changing, <laughs> changing everything. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, in terms of, um, you know, more interest and, um, oh, you were talking about eco-anxiety actually. So, and I noticed this pattern, kind of a connection from last year or kind of like a building of interest ever since I've been in this position. Uh, and I think it started with my octopus teacher people it's, and I always talk about this, this light in people's eye or that when they're lit up, Right. And, and, and where I get that from is inspired by the work that kind of brought me into this field, right? Um, I, I was a, a wilderness field instructor for a wilderness therapy camp for at-risk youth for four years. Uh, and so being immersed in the natural world and working with, you know, what would be called troubled teens uh, in nature for extended period of time, like these students would be out there for some of them a hundred plus days. I worked two weeks on, two weeks off, right? But being that immersed uh, in nature, it it does transform you. And so the first time I noticed that that light was the moment that students would, uh, they would get it, right? It's like they would constantly resist, resist, resist uh, this kind of psychological change, right? The work that they needed to do. But then one day they would just get it, right? And they would they would find themselves interconnected with the the rest of the natural world. And they would see how, you know, they were uh, becoming aligned with their purpose. Right. And then it's time for them to graduate. So that was the first time I saw this, this lighting up. And I think, you know, you as a a, a professor probably get that in students that, that look when they come up to you and, and they seem changed by something. Do you you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, because of course, outdoor experience can facilitate that, but so can uh, a lecture or a reading or uh, certainly a film like a film. My Octopus Teacher. And uh, and yeah, something happens with like, oh, right. It turns out like I'm not just like living in the world. I'm the world, you know, mm. we're, we're part of the universe. We're integral to it. And of course, there's a sense of separateness because we're not the same. I'm not a banana. I'm not a turtle. Mm. 
And yet we're all part of this web of life. I think actually right. humans do share a pretty good amount of DNA with bananas. Yeah, yeah, so yeah it's, definitely. You know, it turns out that there's this weird sense, of, of course we're different, but there's this deep continuity as well. And once people discover that continuity, uh, yeah, you can definitely see the, the kind of change in their eyes, which is yeah. a sense of uh, a kind of groundedness, but also a sense of concern. It's like, mm. uh oh, it turns out the health of my body, my extended self is not doing well. Mm. And uh, so there's yeah. you know, this hope and passion, but there's also concern. Yeah. And so, which is uh, great. Ultimately, that's what's going to drive the kind of ethical changes that we need to empower people to make a better world. Uh, but yeah, so I get a mix, especially because I teach a class on climate change. So sometimes it's not this, hey, we're all connected. It's, oh, oh yeah, we're all connected. <laughs> well, that's another way to realize you're connected. It's just the the um, the opposite side of the coin, the same coin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, anyways, um, I, I kind of went down that little tangent based upon my octopus teacher, because uh, at the business meeting last year and this year, I have had multiple people come up to me and, and want to talk about animal sentience, right? And one of them brought up my activist teacher. And I think that woke her up to this idea of, of animal sentience and sapience. And then we had a few representatives from the psychology, culture, and religion unit who were attended our business meeting. And, and they were just so excited. And um, I had talked to them too late. So, so we didn't get a co-sponsorship together for this year. But for the next year, for 2025, uh, there's talk of co-sponsoring with the psychology culture and religion unit on, um, you know, animal sentience, also potentially eco-anxiety specifically uh, in sites of environmental justice. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm interested in how that fits into the field, right? Because that's what I said before that I feel like the field is going in two to two or three different directions. One, one would be Kind of concerns for environmental justice, decolonization, climate change. And then the other is thinking about our interconnection with the planetary whole. And I think a lot of that research coming out in animal sentience is helping people to wake up to that interconnection, right? And so, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And for that matter, you know, more recently, people have been talking increasingly about plant sentience. Mm, or yeah. uh, or mushrooms that's been mushrooms. one recently with Merlin Sheldrake's work uh, Entangled Life, which I believe is coming out as a documentary if it's not already. Um, and I think uh, Bjork is among the narrators for it. So oh, that should fun. be fun. Because uh, it's one of those things like the, the more we keep uh, studying yeah. uh, the natural world, the more it turns out it's not the machine that early modern scientists thought it was. In fact, it's alive. And yeah. uh, and I, you know, there's a book that I edited with uh, Mary Evelyn John uh, that came out of a conference where a lot of people working on thinking about sentience uh, kind of came together because it's something sciences are saying, but it's also something religions have been saying for a long time. Yes. Right. That there's everything's alive to some extent, whether you're talking about animism in indigenous communities or thinking about uh, Buddhist conceptions of sentience, like you mentioned right. before. Uh, so yeah, I appreciate that there's that kind of interest because I think that's an important direction for the field to go. Yeah, I appreciate your support. I don't, I, 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 I agree. Um, and I, I, I want to ush, I want to make that connection. I want to, I want to kind of hold myself to that for, for the next year because well, there yeah. is a lot of excitement there. And hopefully anybody listening, uh, you know, submit papers because, uh, I don't know when the yes. call for papers, uh, is due, but it's a couple months, you know, so it right. was a good time to think about that. So if anybody's really trying to get in, Oh yeah. Uh, maybe try and get a, a panel together uh, thinking about sentience where you do research from animal behavior studies and psychology, but also looking at religious perspectives on it. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think that'd be exciting. Yeah, definitely. So there's just the very small sentence in the middle of the call for papers that talks about um, interest in, in because the, the, the top for next year is violence, nonviolence, and the margins. And so kind of fitting into that idea of the margins, right? That this is a marginalized perspective, thinking about plant, uh, animal, and fungal sentience, uh, and, and, and highlighting research that brings that to the forefront. And what does that mean for not just this field, but for reality, right? What, what does that mean for how we, we treat each other, how we treat the planet? Um, if, 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 as more and more of this research comes out, integrating the reality behind these concepts, right? 
Yeah, no, I appreciate that because I was writing something recently and I got some feedback um, from, you know, it's a whole complicated thing. I don't need to go into it. But basically I was talking about like Gaia theory, which essentially is saying the earth is something like a living organism. And it's much truer to say it's alive than to say that it's dead or inert or a machine. And so I was basically saying, yeah, so earth is uh, effectively alive. Mm. And they were like, mm, maybe mm. it's kind of like it's alive. I was like, no, we can, let's go ahead and say it's a lot. Insofar as it's self-organizing, it's an organism. That's what organisms do. They self-organize. And so mm -hmm. if you have any kind of autopoietic system of self-organization, well, why not say alive? And they're like, Whoa. Yeah. so yeah. Uh, it's amazing how much it still is a marginalized perspective. Because yeah. if you do a lot of work in it personally, and you're reading about plant intelligence, animal intelligence, and sentience, and things like that, then it's obvious. And then you talk to folks who aren't invested in it, and they're like, no, I think mm. you might be an insane person. Yeah, um, the, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, certainly marginalized and definitely not the first thing that comes to mind when people think of marginalized uh, topics, they're going to think of marginalized human communities exactly. and people on the margins in terms of race or geography or class. Uh, right. So yeah, I appreciate that that's being brought in. So hopefully uh, we'll get a, get a good panel out of it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, which those uh, human communities are important too, but we also want to expand as well, right? Uh, and and I think this would be an interesting way to do that for sure. And so in yeah, you know, and speaking of the human communities, uh, I know the religion and class unit right was also interested in maybe you're going to co-sponsor something with them. Yes. So we. Uh, so kind of going back to a, a panel, a paper that I didn't highlight. So one of our uh, steering committee members, Tara Rowe, Dr. Tara Rowe, she published a book on um, uh, critical petrotheology, right? And so a concurrent session while she was, she wrote this book and so they had this panel on that, uh, highlighting her work. And then a, a concurrent session, which is one that I ended up going to um, because I wanted to make this connection. It actually worked out because we have a, a co-sponsorship. Uh, and so, yeah, we're co-sponsoring next year with the class religion and theology unit. And so uh, the panel this year uh, that they were talking about was you know, Jorg Rieger's book. Who Didn't you have Jorg on the Yeah, podcast? Yeah, Jorg uh, was on not too long ago. And uh, and more recently, likewise, Tara Rowe uh, was on oh, and talked perfect. about uh, her book. Yeah, it's always okay when guests uh, aren't familiar with all of the episodes. Uh, and they're like, have you then... Oh, yeah, Tara on. I'm like, okay, well, maybe you didn't listen to Maybe you episode. should have listened to every episode. <laughs> that should be my homework. Yeah, really, everybody should be tuning in regularly. Well, that's why it's a podcast. If you miss it, that's okay. It's available online, you know, so you can find it later. <laughs> yeah, I'll watch it later. <laughs> watch or listen. <laughs> While you're driving, running. Is yeah, right. Running? Cooking, uh, doing dishes, exercising, really anything. You can have it on. <laughs> Just keep it on the whole day. Yeah catch up learn <laughs> about the field of study <laughs> um yeah so thinking about class the anthropocene violence and nonviolence in that world uh we're also uh, doing a potential co-sponsorship with the religion and food unit uh and then because the native traditions in the americas co-sponsorship with us this year was so successful we're trying for a I believe a triple co-sponsorship next year. Um, so the native traditions in the Americas, the indigenous religious traditions unit, and then the religion ecology unit. So I think that's where we're going to focus on uh, nonviolence and decolonial perspectives. But another thing in the call for papers that I'm particularly excited about, because when I heard the call, um, right, because the AAR in general, changes their topic each year. And so this year, the top or next year, the topic is going to be violence, nonviolence and the margins. And so for me, uh, I've been particularly, I wouldn't say inspired, but intrigued, uh, well, intrigued and inspired by the, the, the interplay of violence and nonviolence in religious uh, or environmental activism. Because to me, there's an interplay going on, right? I think we are very inspired by the work, the nonviolent work of, of activists, right? And I know that you've had uh, Heather Eaton on this uh, 
podcast, which I did watch that one twice, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, and she does a lot of work on peace and nonviolence. And so, right, ideally, as, you know, from a religious perspective, you would focus and try to do the work of justice through a nonviolent, peaceful manner. But when you think about it, violence is happening to the earth. The earth is the victim of violence every day. And so at what point is it us defending a piece of ourselves, right? If you were to affirm the ecological self that yes, the earth is an extension of my body and someone is doing violence to the earth, at what point is violence called? And I'm not saying we need to, you know, be violent, but at what point is violence called for to protect yourself, right? Because I'm thinking about in law, if someone, you know, attacks you, that at some point in a court of law, you are justified to act in accordance of defending yourself, right? Right, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, law, but also um, ethics. And uh, people like Thomas Aquinas, you know, drawing on like Aristotle's uh, virtue ethics, argue that it's okay to kill in self-defense. Mm, and, right, self defense. That's what yeah, I'm thinking of. And like I, a big thing for virtue ethics is the desire has to be correct. And so you can't enjoy it. You can't like want to do it. If, if you're like, finally, a chance to murder somebody because they're attacking <laughs> me. Like, no, you got to not like it, but it is mm -hmm. okay. And um, so, yeah, interesting that in, you know, Catholic virtue ethics from Thomas Aquinas, yeah, mur murder and self defense isn't really seen as murder. It's it's an outcome of, of self defense because somebody was being so violent. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's an interesting point at what point, uh, is it justified to be harmful in a variety of ways? There's the old distinction too, between, uh, violence against people and violence against property. And, uh, you know, so that's a big one. Is it, oh, that's a good one. if I, um, like some activists that, uh, spilled some soup on a Van Gogh painting, exactly. Right? And yeah. they're like, that's just a Van Gogh painting. What, what's worth more is like the earth's biodiversity. Mm. And so we need to care about that. Plus, it was That's it was protected by a plastic thing, so they knew they weren't actually damaging the painting. It was it just got mm. the plastic in front of the painting. Strategic, um, yeah. And so, like that, you know, eco sabotage is when you're just breaking stuff. Eco terrorism is if you're hurting people. Um, oh. So that's yeah, because it's been old issue, you know, from like the 1970s with like the Earth First movement and Dave Foreman and folks like that. And uh, or more recently, Andreas Malm and his very well known book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, uh, which also mm. has been released as a documentary. And uh, so, yeah, questions of where and to what extent any kind of violence or harm. I mean, there's different terms to use. And uh, so, yeah, I appreciate that that's the theme overall for the AAR because it does relate deeply to ecological struggles. And, you know, yeah. part of Heather Eaton's point was sticking to nonviolence because yeah. violence begets violence. It does. And, uh, and, and yet sometimes the question of what constitutes violence can be a little, uh, fuzzy because certainly people are like, you're doing violence by harming a Van Gogh painting. It's like, is that violence? Right. So yeah. So big questions. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I appreciate that that's in the call for papers and hopefully you get an interesting panel together and be nice to get some activists on there. I know you've been thinking about yep. a representative from something like Extinction Rebellion, but also maybe from uh, a youth movement like, uh, the Sunrise Movement. Yeah. And, uh, what an or Fridays for about this. What are the yeah, Fridays for the future? Yeah. 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 Very good. Yeah. I have been very inspired by that. I love having scholars come together and talk to each other, but I have been at certain panels where um over at University of San Francisco as part of a panel in ecofeminism where you had scholars, scholar of law, scholar of, you know, ethics, but then an actual person who is living in an environmental justice site. And so it's one thing because you hear the tone of their voice, you hear the desperation. And to that person, I don't care about the numbers. I don't care about the facts. I'm just trying to live. I'm trying to keep my child alive. And so I, I think that creates a, a very different level. It, it creates a very different conversation. And so, yeah, I um, as soon as I found out that it was violence, nonviolence in the margins, I went back to my hotel room and I emailed uh, Extinction Rebellion, because the conference will be in San Diego next year. So I emailed the 
uh, Extinction Rebellion of San Diego head, just the main email address. And I'm still waiting to hear back. So if anybody has a connection, please, uh, you know, connect me. I'd love to uh, bring them on the panel and they wouldn't have to pay. You know, I think there's a way to get a voucher oh, to yeah. people who are not in the in, field or yeah. who are not have affiliation. Who are invited speakers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very interesting. I didn't know that they had a, a branch anywhere in California. I mean, that's pretty far for an organization that started in the UK. It's interesting how much it's mm. caught on in other places. Yeah. So yeah. something about their kind of hard nosed tactics is definitely speaking to people. Yeah. And uh, and of course, some people think that some of the stuff they're doing, it constitutes violence if they're yeah. blocking a road or something I'm like, right, it's actually just a blockade, not hurting anybody. Um, but, you know, what constitutes violence is, is exactly what that organization is talking about. Yeah, they tow that line real well. Yeah, it seems like it. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I want to talk to them. There's a lot to be said uh, for have this kind of strategies we need, especially when there's so much foot dragging among yeah. our uh, world leaders. And even yeah. when people are doing stuff, it's it's so not as ambitious as it needs to be. And every year the situation becomes more dire and the action yeah. needs to be uh, a lot more um, intense and rapid. Urgent. And uh, so, yeah, no, that's, that's very interesting. And yeah, I'm excited to see see what comes out of that. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. So that's the conference in a nutshell. Um, I actually think I forgot to talk about my panel. Yeah, very self-effacing and humble. Uh, <laughs> and uh, well, it's OK to circle back. We don't have to have the review and the preview neatly separated because you reviewed <laughs> last year and then we were previewing uh, what's coming up uh, this year. So, but go ahead. What what was your panel? Oh, well, it's going back to this idea of practicality. I love the title of the panel. It was called Getting Your Boots Muddy, right? Because we think about eco-theology and we're, you know, thinking about new concepts of God in terms of climate change or, you know, how to do the work of ecological conversion. How does the environmental crisis change, you know, these concepts of the Bible, whatever. Um, but uh, this panel was focused very much on on practicality. And so kind of if you haven't noticed, we just kind of to circle it back to this idea of the violence, nonviolence activism for next year, uh, it it highlighted the, the work of people who are either doing practical stuff. We had like a scholar, a scholar who has lived on a farm. Uh, someone was taught O'Neill Van Horn, you've had him on the oh, podcast. Yeah. I listened mm -hmm. to that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talked about seed saving, you know, and I, I think once once again, that that practicality really helps students or anybody engaging in this work to not fall into kind of depression or the existential depths and because I think this work can feel so big and so vast but when you find something that you can kind of get your hands on or something to get your boots muddy I think it helps you know create that yeah. change right I was listening to a podcast with uh Tom Brown who is one of the people who brought tracking to the United States or to you know from an indigenous community his elder was stalking wolf uh, an Apache elder. And so he brought the practice of tracking in, into a, a more widespread audience. Uh, and he was really adamant, you know, he's been doing this work for a long time and he's very adamant about how it might not seem like a lot, but if you just focus on one practical thing that you can do, you that's how this change is going to happen. Yeah. And uh, I see that in a lot of the work with eco-anxiety or climate anxiety. And uh, some people focus on the mitigating effects of like mindfulness practice and things like that can help alleviate anxiety. But there's some really low hanging fruit. Go do something. Do it something. turns out that any kind of engagement does alleviate eco anxiety. Yep. So just getting out there, even if it's the smallest thing, uh, yep. just getting out there and being part of some solution uh, is enough to, to alleviate those symptoms and contribute yeah. to a better world. It's so it helps the inner and it helps the outer. Yeah, exactly. It's got that feedback loop. Yeah. Because once you can kind of crawl out of the ego anxiety by doing that one thing, then you have more spaciousness to then take on bigger or more complicated projects. Yeah. And that starts to snowball. And uh, 
it's kind of the affective arc of environmental work. You know, it's initially you're like, oh, things are really bad. Oh, and I'm part of the problem and my society's part of the problem. And uh, it's not looking very hopeful. And eventually you're in a pit of despair and nihilism and then a little bit of activism or action and you pull yourself out and then all of a sudden joy and hope and mm -hmm. uh you know more positive feelings uh sense of belonging all yeah. that stuff starts to to come about so yeah it's easy easy advice for people just go out and do something do something yeah yeah yep even if it's something like not activism but forest bathing i did forest bathing for the first time it was an hour of i mean it was enjoyable but once again i saw that light in people's eyes yeah. And, uh, you know, Sarah Jaquette Ray has a book on uh, a field guide to climate anxiety and, uh, she does environmental studies and works with a lot of, um, you know, like Gen Z, uh, kind of, uh, people who, you know, if you're around 20 right now, you're facing mm -hmm. the, a tough, uh, life ahead in terms of your relationship to a stable earth. And, uh, she had one student that got a lot of results from baking cookies. Mm. In that case, you don't even yeah. need to do something that's in any way environmentally oriented. I mean, of course, cookies are environmentally oriented. They're made of the environment, but it's not <laughs> what's normally considered environmental activism in any way, or even something like forest bathing or nature connection or nature meditations. Uh, so yeah, anything, just do something, even if it's a little act of self-care and treating yourself to some sweets. Yeah, uh, self-care. Yeah, and yeah. that's enough to kind of keep the, the nihilism at bay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that self-care doesn't always this is something i'm coming to terms with that self-care doesn't necessarily mean meditation or a bath like i went zip lining yesterday and that made all of the it was like a you know all the feelings were gone you just need the like yeah. something you just have to know yourself like what is it that is gonna get those the anxiety it's like getting the cobwebs out a little bit too Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, you know, a connection to nature as well, because you're not just ziplining and some kind of indoor thing. You're amongst the redwoods of Northern California and uh, on what was a rainy day. And so that's definitely Complete a, a kind immersion. Of, yeah, that's definitely a deep kind of immersive experience in nature. So and that's there's a lot to be said for that adventure sports and things like that. And uh, how that's uh, another way to, to kind of connect with nature and to alleviate all the negative emotions we feel when we think about the future of life on Earth. Yeah. Maybe we'll part with the religion and sports unit next year. Yeah, I would be curious to see if they're engaged <laughs> enough in interest. Much. Yeah, and yeah. Like, no, we're not thinking of that. We're more interested in how much people uh, worship football teams or something like that. Yeah, I think so. Too. Uh, there's a lot there, but I don't know. I'm not up on that unit at all. So uh, I'd be curious. But that's one of the things I'm excited about over the last few years is just seeing how much uh, other units are interested in the religion ecology unit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's very exciting. It's, it's, it's great. It's a, it's a great, uh, kind of marker of, of the field. Yeah. And, uh, hopeful to see more religious studies, people kind of hearing the call and being like, religion has a lot to do with how we respond to the environmental crisis, whether you're thinking of class, whether you're thinking of indigenous communities, whether you're thinking of sports, uh, psychology, uh, whatever you're doing in religious studies, uh, there's some way to to bring that to bear on, on kind of the moral force we need to to address our issues. Yep, absolutely. Well, that might be a good time to wrap up. Um, and because, you know, we don't know the whole future of the field looking into our crystal ball. Uh, but it seems like this year's uh, conference is going to be really good in San Diego. So, yeah, I encourage anybody uh, listening or watching to go ahead and check out the call for papers. Is that up yet? It's not up yet. Uh, and Does it come out like early February normally? So it will. I believe it comes out in January. Okay. So it'll come out in January and then you have time to apply up until mid-march early to mid-march right, right so the call will come out you know you know get your ideas and then apply by march uh but kind of to go back on your point about the, there's no crystal ball in the the future of the field it really is led by the interest of the people that are involved right the, the people that attended so if you're you know 
interested in what we're talking about, you are lit up, you have an idea for the future, or even if you're angry at what we're talking about, I feel like anger is also a, a, a voice that's trying to guide you to a, a new direction, right? Anger gives you energy to do the work as well. Um, so something you're saying is, is, is lighting you up in any way, you want to be involved in the field. It, it is up to the AAR members, it is up to the people who apply. Um, and kind of if you're interested in being on the steering committee, right, just start small, apply, reach out, show up to the 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 unit the panels introduce yourself and talk about what what your interests are whether or not you've published in that at, at all just what are you thinking about in terms of uh the field of religion and ecology yeah that's good good advice for folks uh it's uh, a very welcoming and warm community uh and i've you know i know that's not just us that thinks that i get that feedback from a lot of people and uh yeah. and i'm sure there's other groups that are too but uh, we might be the best <laughs> um, <laughs> we try. I mean, we definitely. <laughs> yeah. We have fun. Yeah, I think so. Um, well, great. I'll go ahead and let you go. Uh, thanks for making time for us once again. And uh, we'll have you back on for your annual uh, review and uh, preview again uh, next year. I'm guessing. Who knows? Again, we don't can't tell the future. <laughs> a lot of deep uncertainty. Um, and sometimes I just assume the podcast will continue indefinitely. I don't know. And uh, I think we got, we'll go in at least another year. I'll just take it a year Maybe at a time. another year. Yeah. And, uh, and then who knows? Who knows the future? But it's certainly a lot of fun uh, to get to chat with people, including yourself. Well, thank and, you. Uh, so, yeah, looking forward to, uh, to another year and see what 2024 brings. And hopefully by the end of it all, we'll have solved all of our environmental problems. <laughs> I oh, know that's not funny. I don't know why that would be funny. We do uh, our best. We do our best. I'm optimistic. Good. Uh, <laughs> Keep it up. Keep up the optimism. We need it. Thank you. Uh, well, geez, thanks, Kimberly Carfor. Thanks again. Uh, yeah, thanks really, for having uh, me. It was yeah. a lot of fun. Well, good. And uh, and thanks to everybody for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back soon with some more conversations for you. As usual, take care. Be well.